Good afternoon, folks, and thanks for joining us. I'm Gabe Horowitz with Third Way. Before this pandemic, there was a real need to modernize our credentialing system so it reached more people. But looking ahead to a post-COVID era, transforming our credentialing system is even more essential than ever. So think about it. 36 million Americans have been laid off in the past two months, and more layoffs are coming. Now, some of these folks will get jobs again when things ease up in the economy, but more than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Large and small employers have filed for bankruptcy, and certain sectors will be changed forever. So getting the right credentials will be even more important as tens of millions of people seek to re-enter the workforce, often looking for different jobs in different industries. And yet, here's the problem. Our credentialing system is fragmented, it's too hard to get credentials quickly, and there is not enough linking different sources of learning. But luckily, we can fix this. With support from the Lumina Foundation, we brought together 10 experts and innovators to showcase ways to transform our credentialing system. But as I've told them, rather than focusing on one meal, we wanted to give you a bunch of appetizers. So I've asked each of them to be quick, just two to three minute talk, and then I'll, there's time I'll follow up and ask a question. Our goal here is not to answer every question about every facet of every idea. It's just to give you a sample of ways to help people get credentials more easily. And frankly, my other goal is just to introduce you to some extremely smart and talented thinkers. So let's get into it. One barrier to credentials is a lack of access to opportunities in the first place. And one population that often suffers from this is incarcerated Americans. Dr. Monique Ashitelu with New America looked at federal and state prisons to determine whether training is available behind bars and whether those programs help folks, help folks succeed in the labor market. So Monique, let me turn to you. Hello, thank you so much for me and thanks for that introduction, Gabe. So for the past year and a half, I have done a deep dive analysis and looking at some national representative data on adults in US federal and state prisons, as well as looking um, at different prisons across the country where I've had the opportunity to speak with over 200 individuals directly impacted by correctional post-secondary education and job training programs. And in my collective of research, I've discovered about nine in 10 adults in US federal and state prisons uh, will be released with over half expecting to be released within the next two years. And so with an overwhelming majority of adults returning back to the communities, about 70% of the population want to enroll in a college getting a job post-release. However, although research has shown that post-secondary education is meaningful to both re-entry and as well as to um, labor market success, many U.S. correctional facilities have actually moved away from providing post-secondary educational opportunities to those who are incarcerated. And so ultimately, the reality is that the success rate for re-entry is relatively low which kind of fed me to want to do my research to identify effective correctional rehabilitative programs to help these individuals get these and also help them with labor market preparation. So I evaluated the literacy and numeracy skills of incarcerated population and I compared that with the general public. And what I found was that on average, incarcerated population tend to be less proficient in these skills compared to the general public. However, when these individuals actually complete a post-secondary credential and or job training while serving time in prison, this gap in skills is actually reduced and in cases it's eliminated. And so regardless of race, gender, age, or even how much time you have less to serve, completing a credential time actually so what can we do to allow these individuals to have access to these critical credentials first and foremost the reentry process must happen early on it must happen and it must prioritize higher education as well as job training secondly as Gabe mentioned you know we are in a global pandemic that is having economic impacts and a lot of times that calls for budget cuts however that cannot happen in regards to correctional education Actually, federal and states, they 
actually need to invest into these programs. In particular, for example, looking at a federal level, Pell Grants, reinstating Pell Grants to become accessible to those who are incarcerated so that they can be able to access higher education. Keeping in mind that you want to avoid just limiting these grants to those who are close to receive who, excuse me, those who are close to reentry, because given the longstanding racial disparities that we have in sentencing, um, those who have longer and indeterminate sentences are individuals of color. And so you don't want to have policies that perpetuate inequities, higher education, so they can earn these credentials. I like to end my little piece on a quote from one of my students that I met at a a correctional facility in California last year and he said it's really important for us to have these rehabilitative programs to help us make different choices so that we don't fall back into our old way of doing things when we return back to our communities that we left. Thank you so much. Monique that was so helpful thank you. Let me ask you a quick question. What's the level of employer engagement when it comes to job training programs behind bars? Are employers engaged? Are they not? Yeah, and so that's another recommendation in my report is that you really need this uh, partnership with industry employers in the communities that they'll be released with, with these job training programs. And because job training within a correctional setting is very vast and it looks very different, it depends on how robust that program is. So some programs robust and they have those partnerships. And one I went to, they actually had jobs waiting for them because they had those partnerships established. And so I think that's the model that's very, very important to help individuals transfer their credentials and to actually uh, have an adjustment upon release. That is great. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to transition now. And you know, it's interesting, even if credentialing opportunities are available, that doesn't mean that you can necessarily take advantage of them, particularly if you can't afford to but employers can actually help with the affordability piece. I wanna to turn to Jana Barisi from Walmart, who's gonna talk about Live Better You. That's Walmart's program to help its workers access credentialing opportunities. Jana, let me take Great, thanks Gabe. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Good, Good. and thanks for the opportunity to participate today, um, and I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy during this time. I do just wanna mention a little bit about what's been happening in our company uh, over the past uh, several weeks. As you've probably seen, our associates have been amazing during this time as they've served their customers and communities. And in a difficult economic situation, given the demand we've experienced, we've also hired over 200,000 new associates since late March. Many of these associates are temporary, but we've been glad to be able to provide a bridge for people, particularly those in hospitality and restaurants who may have been furloughed due to the crisis. We're committed to making Walmart a place of opportunity. This means giving people a good, steady job that could turn into a career. We have our in-house training programs through Walmart Academies that can help our associates prepare for the roles and jobs of the future in retail. Less than two years ago, we started our partnership with Guild Education to offer Walmart associates a path to debt-free college through our Live Better You initiative. Live Better You also provides access to professional certification programs in in-demand fields such as pharmacy and vision technicians, and certain information technology programs as well. All Walmart associates are eligible for the program, part-time, full-time, salaried. When we studied the best ways to build a college access program, it became clear that many models are did not designed with the realities of the working learner in mind. Reimbursement models, for example, can front load student costs. Barriers such as cost, time, and degree relevancy can also lead to low completion rates among adult learners. As of recently, we have about 16,000 active students in Live Better You, and nearly 200,000 associates have expressed interest in the programs. In fact, back in February, we had our first Live Better You college graduates. This educational opportunity can be a launching pad for them to succeed in their jobs today and pre prepare them for their jobs of tomorrow. Also, through our participation in the administration's American Workforce Policy Advisory Board, we are working with companies and educational institutions, including Workday, LinkedIn, and Western Governors University on a pilot interoperable learning record. This ILR pilot will enable a new level of information sharing for individuals, companies, and institutions. ILRs can provide employers with new efficiencies, put individuals in control of their learning records, and provide individuals with more control over their careers. And before I wrap up, just a couple public policy responses that could be helpful 
for le working learners as well as they try to access upskilling and career development opportunities. First, we'd encourage policymakers to consider proposals that would allow Pell funds to be used for high quality, short term, market aligned credential programs. In addition, Section 127, which provides the income exclusion for employer provided education benefits, should be modernized. This includes updating what can be covered under the exclusion, such as technology that's instrumental to completion of a degree program. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks so much for that. Um, Jana, let me ask you, in terms of other employers who are looking to create programs like this, do you have any advice, any things that have worked well or things that you would do differently going forward? Yeah, I think the, the notion of thinking about where the barriers exist for people in, in pursuing education while they're working as well. So cost is a big one, um, time is a big one, um, even though, so through the Guild program, we provide uh, coaching assistance. So for people who maybe don't have experience with the higher education application process or even filling out a FAFSA form, just helping provide guidance um, and direction along the way for people. Um, so they have uh, some, you know, some folks helping them navigate the, the process of um, getting into the program and completing it as well. That's great. I have a million more questions for Monique and for you, but I promise we're going to keep this train going. Um, I want to build on what we've just heard because there's some great thinking happening about ways to help people pay for credentials throughout their careers. We've heard about this issue of pay from our first two speakers. Um, Ethan Pollack with Aspen, let me turn to you. You guys have two proposals out there to help that very issue. So why don't you take it away? Definitely. And uh, thank you, Gabe, for this. Uh, um, the, the COVID crisis presents an acute challenge to workers' health and well-being, uh, but it's also revealed widespread vulnerabilities in the economy that predate the pandemic. Uh, so one example of this is skills training, the, the topic of this event. Um, the, in contrast to many other countries, our lifelong learning system relies really heavily on the employment relationship. Uh, uh, businesses are supposed to hire less skilled workers and upskill them and to continue to provide training over the course of their workers' careers to help them uh, keep up their, their changing skill needs. Uh, now, there's many fantastic businesses that still follow this high road employment relationship, um, but over the last 40 years or so, uh, there's been an aversion to, uh, to training workers with businesses uh, oftentimes preferring to buy talent on the open market, uh, creating a tragedy of the commons situation where uh, businesses all want to draw from a rich talent pool, but no one really wants to build the talent pool. And again, there's definitely exceptions. I think that, that Walmart is a very good exception doing a lot of work with its uh, uh, employer-provided tuition assistance uh, and, and, and many others. But, um, but we do see a, a still a long-run trend in, um, in, being, in being averse to, um, to kind of building this talent pool. Um, so at the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative, uh, you know, we've proposed a worker training tax credit um, to encourage businesses to invest in their work, in their employees, and also a lifelong learning and training uh, accounts uh, to help workers access high quality training opportunities. Um, the worker training tax credit would uh, mirror the policy design of the popular uh, research and development uh, tax credit uh, in that it only subsidizes the increase in the training investment over time. Uh, businesses would establish a base um, expenditure level for qualified training expenses, uh, which would be determined by averaging the amounts spent in each of the three years prior to the current tax year. Uh, the value of the credit would be 20% of the difference between the current expenditure level uh, and the base expenditure level. Uh, the, Lifelong learning and training accounts would be funded by workers, employers, and, uh, um, and government uh, to help workers pay for education and training over the course of their careers. Uh, beginning at age 18, workers would be eligible to contribute up to $2,000 per year into their lifelong learning account on a pre-tax basis, which would be matched by a means-tested government contribution. Uh, Low-income workers could receive a 50% match. Um, both of these uh, proposals have a number of important features. Uh, first, to qualify for either proposal, uh, pr uh, policy, the training must lead to an industry-recognized credential or must be eligible under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. 
Uh, this ensures that the baseline, a baseline level of quality and for the tax credit guides businesses towards investing in skills that are portable across firms, which are more valuable to workers. Uh, second, both the credit and the accounts would only cover training for non-highly compensated workers, uh, which is about less than uh, $120,000 a year. Um, this is a standard that already exists in the, in the tax code. Uh, we know that higher wage workers tend to have more access to, to training. Uh, businesses prefer to invest in higher wage workers because that's where there's more competition to, re to recruit those workers and, re and retain those workers. Uh, so this provision ensures that the benefits flow to the workers that are really in need. Um, and we know that, you know, looking back at, at this crisis, we know that, um, you know, there's trends like e-commerce and automation are likely to be accelerating as we speak. And this could lead to millions of jobs permanently disappearing. Uh, these workers will need help transitioning to new jobs and occupations, and many will require new skills. Uh, we believe that a worker training tax credit and lifelong learning accounts will encourage businesses to hire and train workers and give workers the ability to train for new jobs during the pandemic. Um, and these approaches will facilitate a quicker recovery and a more productive workforce to the benefit of the entire economy. Ethan, thank you so much. Let me ask you just real quickly, are you seeing, are any states doing this kind of at a um, smaller level than the federal government? Yes, definitely. There's a number of states that have done um, both worker training tax credits and also lifelong learning accounts. Uh, so in for lifelong learning accounts, there's been demonstration projects uh, implemented in Maine, in Washington State, in Chicago, and New York City. Um, and in um, <clears throat> And for the worker training tax credit, uh, you know, we've seen uh, examples of, of, of tax incentives for businesses to invest in their workers in Kentucky, Georgia, uh, Connecticut, Mississippi, Rhode Island, and Virginia. And these incentives range from between 5% to 50% of eligible training expenses. Uh, additionally, we see this, it, it, you see a lot of international examples of, uh, of worker training tax credits as well. And for lifelong learning accounts, we're increasingly seeing uh, in, in France and in Singapore, and more recently in the last year in uh, Canada has implemented this approach as well. That's great, thank you so much. You know, now that we can all afford our credentialing program, the question is really, where do you go? Um, Lul Tesfai with New America is gonna be speaking on degree apprenticeships, which is New America's proposal for really more closely integrating apprenticeships with higher education. Lul, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Gabe, for organizing this conversation, and thanks for everyone for dialing in. Um, while degree apprenticeships are fairly common in countries like Germany, Switzerland, and most recently the United Kingdom, they're less common here in the United States despite our rich history of offering apprenticeship programs. A degree apprenticeship is an education and training program that is delivered by an institution of higher education and that incorporates paid, structured, on-the-job learning and mentorship into a career-focused post-secondary degree program, whether it's an associate's degree program or a bachelor's degree program. And it features you know, many of the elements of a proven apprenticeship program. So much like apprenticeships, um, apprentices and degree apprenticeships are employed, they're earning a wage from day one, they're um, earning progressive wage increases as they gain more skills and competencies and they split their time between on the job training and the classroom. But what just differentiates a degree apprenticeship is that students in degree apprenticeships um, have a portion or all of the courses that they're taking count towards a degree. And there are three main reasons that I wanna to highlight today for why degree apprenticeships should be a key component of our credentialing strategy. One is that it really addresses the demand for college educated workers. We know that many occupations in high growth, high wage industries like IT and healthcare and uh, financial services require a college degree for career entry and, in that, in, and advancement. Um, and this is especially important during economic recessions. We learned from the Great Recession that the, the share of job vacancies requiring a bachelor's degree um, increased by more than 60%. And all net new jobs created after the Great Recession went to people who had graduated college. So even more reason to be exploring degree apprenticeships as a recovery strategy now. Another reason why degree apprenticeships are important is because they recognize a, a, a key component of a post-secondary completion strategy. Fewer than 40% of community college students earn a certificate or a degree within six years of enrollment. 
and integrating apprenticeship training and post-secondary program pathways can really improve access to experiential learning, which the data shows is effective, as well as mentorship and other support systems to get people through college. And we've seen some innovative programs out there, including Norco College's um, degree apprenticeship programs that are competency-based and that award up to 16 credits academic credits for the learning that takes place on the job, which just goes to show that apprentices aren't necessarily part-time students, but full-time learners. The last uh, reason for degree apprenticeships that I'll highlight is that it helps make higher education more accessible. Degree apprenticeships are oftentimes offered at little or no cost to the apprentices, and that's because employers recognizing the value of customized training oftentimes pay um, the tuition in addition to the wages. And there are some states that have implemented policies like California and Texas that subsidize the tuition for apprentices. So apprentices aren't necessarily choose to force, forced to choose between going to work and pursuing an education. They can actually do both. So I'm sold. Thank you for that. I, my question for you, Lola, is, you know, for policymakers on this video conference, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of policy to expand this program? That's a great question. And Gabe, you started um, the conversation today by talking about our fragmented systems. Our apprenticeship system and our higher education system have um, traditionally functioned separate from one another. So one thing that would be really helpful is dedicated funding to help um, you know, develop these programs that really need to um, you know, be done in coordination. Another area is, um, you know, finding state policies that really cover the cost of tuition. Like I mentioned, there are a couple of innovative states out there, but this is something that um, is absolutely necessary because degree apprenticeships are oftentimes more costly than traditional apprenticeships. So there needs to be some dedicated funding for that. And then I, I mentioned Norco College, which offers a, a competency-based program um, by leveraging their existing um, credit for prior learning structures and state guidance on how to use um, prior learning assessments and, and other forms of recognizing learning that takes place outside of the classroom through work-based learning opportunities is absolutely important as we think about ways to shorten the time to um, post-secondary completion. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, degree apprenticeships are one innovative way that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, help people gain credentials. There's another model out there, and that's Merit Americas, which doesn't happen on a college campus. Molly Elegant Cossert is going to talk a little bit about Merit America, which provides credentials through a combination of online learning, in person coaching, and peer support groups. So, Molly, let me turn it over to you. Great. And thanks, Gabe. I'm honored to be part of this talented group discussing an incredibly important topic. Um, so I'm here to tell you about Merit America. We're a fast growing nonprofit that creates pathways for workers who are stuck in low wage work to transition into higher paying careers in STEM with significant upward mobility. Our program is fast, flexible, and designed to work for underemployed and unemployed adults. We combine on-demand online learning, as Gabe mentioned, with intensive individual career coaching, peer support, and job placement support, all of which is now delivered fully virtually to create a highly effective, scalable model. Who we serve, we currently operate in the greater Washington, D.C. area, including Baltimore and Dallas-Fort Worth, and we're expanding to at least two new sites later this year and to dozens more over the next couple of years. Our average learner is 33 years old and making $26,000 before our program, and 40% of them have children. All of them have at least a high school diploma, but none have a four-year degree. The vast majority have some college and an average debt of $10,000 and nowhere uh, to go to improve their career prospects. Over 70% of them are persons of color. Our results so far are promising. 85% of our learners graduate with industry recognized credentials in STEM fields. 70% of our job seekers have started new careers with average wage gains of over $18,000. Our model was started to address a gap we saw in the market, and that is a need for one, programs that are accessible for low wage adult workers who can't do full time in person programs and need to balance work or sometimes being in and out of the workforce, their families paying rent and other obligations, and two, scalable uh, programs. Our program is a magnitude lower as far as costs than similar programs 
uh, driven primarily by a thoughtful balance between technology and uh, in-person or now virtual person-to-person uh, -person support. Uh, the reduced cost is important to enable a more sustainable model, um, but it also allows us to scale more quickly. Why is scale important to us? It's important to us because the scale of the solution needs to reflect the scale of the challenge. There are an estimated between 50 and 75 million workers in the United States who don't have a four-year degree and are stuck in low-wage work, and that was before COVID-19. The need is that much greater now. Uh, and some promising early evidence that program like programs like ours can help meet this increased need. I'm thrilled to report that in our latest Washington DC area cohort, which had their March 8th graduation canceled because of COVID-19, 80% have found new careers with an average wage gain of $20,000. Results that track our previous experience over the last couple of years, um, but earlier and in a much, much tougher environment. That is a great statistic. Um, so congrats to them. Molly, let me ask you, you know, I think one of the hottest topics right now amid this pandemic is online learning. And I'm curious, are there lessons that you've learned in how to make online learning work for the, the students that you serve? Absolutely. Uh, this is perhaps uh, a, a great surprise, most of all to me, as I've been tracking our progress. I'd say there is a, um, you know, a story out there that online does online doesn't work for low wage workers. And I think it's really a design question. What we have found is that if you do pair that online learning, which is very flexible, so folks can do it after they put the kids to sleep or in between shifts, but with structure, so our programs are very structured, they do have deadlines and intensive support. So they have weekly support sessions and we've gathered data and we proved that uh, when we tried every other week, um, those groups didn't do quite as well as when we had every single week that uh, person to person support, both from career coaches and from peers. Um, two, we have found um, things like stipends. We provide a stipend to our learner, um, also help uh, with general needs and necessities. Um, they do also help get that technology um, up, to, up to speed quite literally in some cases. Um, uh, and um, we have found that the, the peer element, um, of course, is incredibly important. So I think, you know, structure, um, the person uh, support from career coaches and experts, uh, the peer support, you're going through it with somebody, um, and things like stipends to really facilitate um, all uh, lead to incredible results um, and a really personalized, thoughtful approach that, that works uh, for working learners stuck in low-wage jobs. Wonderful, thank you so much. You know, we've talked a lot about access to different credentialing opportunities and how to pay for them. But the question I have is, how do you know which credentials lead to which jobs and have value? Gardner Carrick with the Manufacturing Institute is gonna talk about an effort to find out which credentials have value in the job market. Gardner, let me turn it to you. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hear me okay? All right. So um, uh, the Manufacturing Institute and the National Association of Manufacturers created a system about 10 years ago where we went out and endorsed the best certifications that, that we thought represented the pathways within manufacturing. Uh, and over the course of the next several years, we saw really terrific growth in the number of those certifications issued. Um, a big assist goes to the Labor Department and a lot of their grants that really encourage the embedding of those credentials into traditional community college and technical school pathways. Um, the question that, that we were unable to answer, though, was, were, was the attainment of those credentials really making any difference for individuals in the labor market? And what pathways were they taking to actually achieve those credentials? So we started a project where we tried to, to integrate some of the data from our key credentialing providers, and we chose our biggest three, with some of the other data sets available. So first we took a look at, at the, the traditional education data and, and went to a group called the National Student Clearinghouse to do that. Um, and we reported our data from those three credentialing providers there. And, and what we found was pretty interesting. Um, number one, uh, over 90% of the individuals that earned one of these credentials, these industry certifications, did not earn any other educational credentials. So 
no degree, no one year certificate, no nothing. They came to the college, they earned the industry certification, they, they left. Uh, additionally, we found that roughly 50% of them earned it in a non-credit environment. So not only were they not earning industry credentials, not earning community college credentials, they weren't even earning credit. So um, that obviously has an impact on um, the pathways, on the expectations, on, on the, the definitions of those individuals. Uh, BLS would end up calling them some college, no degree, right? So does that matter? So we then took a look at, at the labor market outcomes and we took that same set of data and reported it to the US Census Bureau and matched it with IRS tax records. And what we found was that um, for individuals before they earned these credentials, you were seeing either stagnating or even declining wages, particularly for those individuals above kind of the traditional uh, community college age group. Um, and after earning that, that certification, we, we saw real sustained ongoing wage gains year over year for at least five years after the attainment of that credential. So it's, um, it, it is a, it's one that we hope to find, but still a very impressive result that, that for young people, they saw an immediate jump as they got into a career, or for mid-career or older workers, this gave them an opportunity to really find a pathway that that's gave them sustained wage gains year over year. So, and for us, the Manufacturing Institute and NAM, it really demonstrated the economic opportunity that's available in manufacturing, right? No matter what age you are, there's a chance for you to earn a good living and to enjoy year over year wage gains. Uh, particularly as we're dealing with the current situation, we're hopeful that, that those individuals that are looking at, at permanent job loss in, in some of our industries would consider manufacturing. And, uh, we think we now have the data to prove that um, there's a pathway that can be as short as one semester to get you an industry certification and begin you on, on a new rewarding career. Gardner, thank you. What's next for this project? So we have uh, multi-year access to the IRS tax records. So we're doing two things. Number one, we're, we're digging in a little deeper. The first was just, let's find out what, what the earnings are. Now we're, we're linking that data to the other Census Bureau records. So can we find out exactly what industries that they're working in? Um, what size companies are they working for? And, and do the results differ from an earnings perspective based on what subsector you're in or what size company you're in? Uh, from there, uh, we, we have, I guess you'd call it automated the process to the point where uh, any other credentialing bodies that are interested in obtaining this type of data can enter our project and, and expect to see results within one to two months. So it's a, a really pretty easy process to scale beyond just the, the big three manufacturing certifications to some of the more or smaller or specialized ones within manufacturing, or even ones outside of the industry entirely. Um, this is not built just for manufacturing, it's really built to, to answer questions for any, any industry and any credentialing body. Gardner, thank you so much. You know, now that we've picked a credential that we know has value, you know, for a lot of folks, when they're students again, they might need help juggling school and work and family responsibilities. And wraparound supports can really help with this. We've heard this from a couple different speakers today. Lindsay Reichlin Cruz with the Institute for Women's Policy Research is going to talk about Head Start College Partnerships. It's a really innovative idea to provide high quality childcare to students who are parents. Lindsay, let me turn it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so roughly 4 million college students are caring for dependent children right now. Student parents face heightened time demands and financial insecurity that can make post-secondary attainment harder for them than for students who don't have kids. And given that half of all student parents are caring for children that are under the age of six, access to affordable and high quality early learning for their children is really essential to their ability to enter and complete post-secondary education. Unfortunately, what we see is that campus-based care has been in decline for over a decade and high quality community-based care is notoriously expensive and hard to secure. 
to help student parent families gain access to the support that they need to earn a post-secondary credential, you have to think about innovative solutions, cross-sector solutions that we've heard a little bit about today that can leverage funding and capacity um, across sectors. So the largest early learning program in the US is the Head Start system. And Head Start is a two-generation program. That means it provides high quality early childhood education to children, as well as wraparound support for parents with a goal of helping them achieve family economic security. Two in five student parents with kids under six are income eligible for this program. And the fact that they have high rates of housing insecurity as well as homelessness increases the chances that they're eligible. In addition, the parents that are already being served by the Head Start program aren't um, likely to have post-secondary post credentials themselves. And program data show that many are really interested in earning those credentials so that they can get better paying jobs. So intentional partnerships between Head Start and post-secondary institutions can promote greater educational attainment for both groups of these parents. We recently conducted a study examining the landscape of Head Start college partnerships that are currently operating to understand their nature, their prevalence, as well as their benefits and challenges. We found that there are about 60 programs out there that involve partnerships between Head Start and colleges and that are explicitly serving parents who are enrolled in post-secondary education. These partnerships include a range of models. So they can be standalone on-campus Head Start programs, they can be integrated Head Start childcare models, or they can be dedicated pipelines between an off-campus program, uh, a Head Start pr program, and an on-campus credential uh, opportunity for parents. So Head Start College Partnerships provide student families with free, key there, <laughs> high quality education for their kids and strength-based supports for parents, including intensive coaching and referrals to services that we know can help them complete credentials. Especially when these partnerships are located on campuses, the support that Head Start providers are providing to parents are informed by in-house knowledge of the services and systems that exist on that campus, right? So it really enhances their ability to meet parents where they are and help them succeed. And the partners also benefit. Colleges see improved rates of completion among students with kids, as well as a strengthened ability to train students in early childhood development programs and other programs that require on-site training. And then Head Start gains access to eligible families that can improve their declining enrollment rates, which is related in part to an expansion of universal pre-K. And it's facilitated in its mission to help families achieve self-sufficiency. So while it's not a perfect solution for every community, and anytime you're trying to merge two big bureaucratic systems, it's gonna be a challenge, these partnerships still represent an important opportunity to leverage cross-system collaboration and improve the ability of families to achieve educational and economic success. Thank you, Lindsay. Let me ask you just a real quick question. Any advice on how we can expand these partnerships to more campuses? There was one or two things that you would do. That's a great question. I think um, Head Start and higher ed to each other are black boxes. So greater, um, you know, access to information, just picking up the phone and trying to understand what these two systems are about, what they can offer each other is really important. And actually, IWPR is currently developing a toolkit for colleges to use and thinking through, is this a solution for me? How would I even go about exploring it? How do I connect with the Head Start program in my community? So just clear steps that can help them make that first move and, and start to shed light on, you know, the large Head Start system that doesn't necessarily um, seem accessible um, off the bat. So I think that's one way. And, you know, we need in increased investment in childcare and early learning opportunities for student families without question. And, and Head Start is a part of that, but Head Start itself only serves, you know, a, a, a fraction of eligible families out there. So we need enhanced investment in early learning programs, including Head Start, as well as in campus childcare that can be, you know, one of those frontline services that really provides wraparound um, support to students who have families of their own. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thanks. You know, now the question is, you know, how can you take a credential and easily show employers what you've learned? Jason Tishko with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation is going to talk about the T3 Innovation Network, which brings together employers and training providers and standards organizations and other stakeholders in the credentialing ecosystem. Jason, take it away. 
Thank you, Gabe, and thank you, Kelsey, for the opportunity to uh, be part of today's event and also want to acknowledge the Lumina Foundation um, uh, as a sponsor of both the T3 Innovation Network as well as the uh, U.S. Chamber's uh, Job Data Exchange effort. Also good to see our um, sister business association, NAM, and the Manufacturing Institute uh, and the project they're leading and enjoys a tremendous amount of support uh, from our team, and we're learning a great deal from them. So glad to, to see that they've been featured here today as well uh, and learned a lot from uh, many of the other presenters. Uh, definitely a lot of follow-ups uh, from today. Uh, but for my portion, what I wanted to share with all of you was some of the work we've been doing around the T3 Innovation Network. This was a network that was kicked off uh, back in 2018 um, as a partnership between the Chamber Foundation and Lumina. Um, and it was originally just to put together a paper on data interoperability in the talent marketplace. Uh, little did we know that we were actually kicking off uh, what's been an ever-expanding open innovation network composed of uh, technology vendors, uh, stakeholders like business associations and companies, uh, education providers like universities, colleges, and K-12 districts, uh, uh, state and federal agencies, uh, nonprofits and foundations, uh, and actually a quarter of the participants in it are international. Um, so the network since uh, its initial kickoff in 2018 has now grown uh, to nearly 500 organizations, uh, the vast majority of which are, are volunteering their, their time and attention. Uh, and what this network has been focused on in, uh, over these years is really the digital transformation of the talent marketplace. Uh, and we've really kind of set our minds to how can we build the underlying data and technology infrastructure uh, that's needed to make three big things happen. Uh, the first, all learning count. And if you think all learning should count, you need a data and technology infrastructure that makes it so. Uh, we need to make sure that learning can actually be uh, uh, captured as data, can be documented as data, and is fully shareable across all major stakeholders in a machine-readable way. Uh, number two, to make competencies and skills the new currency of the talent marketplace. If you think that um, should be the case, you need a data infrastructure to support it. Much like uh, currencies uh, can be translated and exchanged all across the world, you need the same thing for competencies and skills. It's not about trying to create one competency framework or skill ontology to rule them all. It's about being in an open and distributed ecosystem where we are constantly exchanging and translating skill and competency data uh, so we can render them as currency for the purpose of continuing education and employment. Um, so all learning counts, skills and competencies, the new currency, and then uh, most importantly, to make sure that we're addressing the asymmetries um, of this digital infrastructure as it stands today um, and empowering learners and workers with their data. Uh, so making sure we're linking data to individuals um, and empowering individuals to access and make use of that data for a wide variety of purposes. Um, so that's what it's set out to do. There's a number of different projects underneath this umbrella, but two big things I wanna leave you with is this is a collective action scenario where um, a diverse group of stakeholders and technology vendors are getting together to make this skill and competency data infrastructure possible and to make it global. And it's also the network uh, that's supporting this movement around interoperable learning records that, that you heard uh, from our Walmart colleagues uh, to get the data infrastructure right to make ILRs uh, scalable and shareable across a global ecosystem. Um, so the network itself is open and voluntary. Anyone is free to join. Uh, you could be on a fly on the wall. You could actually join the work groups and drive the work, uh, or you can actually help build some of these open data solutions. Uh, it's an exciting time because we're moving into phase three next year, and we're hoping to kind of lay a more long-term strategy in place so the T3 network can kind of continue to support globally uh, this digital transformation for the talent marketplace. Uh, and kind of the, the interesting thought I want to leave you with is imagine um, in a very near future, we are going to be able to capture all learning, regardless of where it happens, and to understand the outcomes associated with that learning. And it's going to generate uh, the next generation of talent analytics uh, for this space. And it's going to have a big impact on how we understand uh, credentialing within it. So thank you again, Gabe, for the opportunity. Absolutely. Jason, what's... Um... What's one of the biggest barriers you face being able to explore all these emerging technologies and testing out all these innovations? Yeah, it's, if anything, it's a coordination problem. It's not a technology problem. The technology is there, uh, but it's been a collective action issue where we've needed a neutral ground for a lot of these partners to come together to build what is essentially a network of networks. There are so many codependencies where you need alignment and harmonization across multiple data standards organizations, but you also need them coordinating with those who are trying to manage skill and competency data, as well as those who are trying to exchange learning records through like blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies. These camps don't naturally have a place to convene and meet together and coordinate. So it's all been kind of happening organically, but now what we've seen is a massive acceleration. And when you provide a network of networks, uh, innovation occurs. Uh, so I think that's been a big thing, but if I could get down to like a real micro issue, 
we talk a big game about skills and competencies kind of being this currency, but until it's rendered as shareable and exchangeable data, it's just rhetoric. And the problem is we have all of these different skill ontologies and frameworks that are out there, but they're not in a machine readable format. They're sitting in PDFs and Word documents. They're behind firewalls. They have no utility in the data infrastructure. And we need to have a big leap forward now and use some common open data tools to start migrating all of that data so it could be transactional. So it's a big bet. It's a global bet. Uh, but it's not science fiction, but we do need to apply ourselves and work as a network of network to get it done because it's not a product problem. It's a data infrastructure problem. Jason, thank you so much. You know, in addition to the T3 network, there's another organization using 21st century technology to change this work and learn ecosystem. Scott Cheney is with Credential Engine. He's going to talk about his company's goal to making Comparing credentials is easy as comparing flights on sites like Kayak or Expedia. So Scott, let me turn it over to you. Sure, thank you very much. And you can see that my Kayak and Expedia journey today has taken me to this lovely lake uh, that is virtually behind me. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And, and I wanna thank Jason for essentially a, a perfect lead in to, to what we do. Um, you know, He points out that, that we need to have interoperability and data sharing between organizations that issue credentials, organizations that, that count on skills and competencies, employers. And he's right that the vast majority of the information about credentials and competencies currently does not sit in machine readable and interoperable formats. Um, and in order to achieve the, the goals that we all have of having tools like interoperable learning records, and, and real-time pathway tools that help people navigate their way through a very complex marketplace. All of this information has to be in machine-readable formats. So what Credential Engine does is we provide um, the, the only competency, or excuse me, the only credential framework and description language that exists um, in order to describe all of the deep details about credentials in the United States. Um, and then there are multiple formats to describe competencies. And the challenge, again, as Jason pointed out, is that most of those competency frameworks sit in PDFs or sit in Word documents, and we just need to get them into some format that is machine readable. We offer one, there are others, we don't care which one they're in, we just need them to be in these, in these structures. So when you think about, go back the, to your very first opening comment, you know, there are 36 million people who are now out of the labor market, hope to get back in, aren't sure what job there's gonna be available to go back into. Even if it's with the same company, there may be different skill requirements post COVID that they need to be able to, to meet. So we need to have much richer information about all of the credentials and skills and competencies that people currently have that are being offered. And that mix is changing itself. There's many providers who are going under there are many more who are gonna be standing up lots of new online short-term programs. And we need rich information about all of those to help people navigate their way back and to demonstrate and signal what skills they have to employers who are now looking to make this match. Last year, we reported that there were 738,000 unique credentials in the United States alone. We're not entirely sure right now what COVID has done to that mix. Uh, both the providers and of the types of credentials, but we know that as, as they come online, we've got to have them in these machine readable formats. So we've been working with now 16 states who have adopted our technologies to make this data into this machine readable format. Um, a couple of examples about work being done. <clears throat> New Jersey is, is launching a, a um, tool, a decision-making tool that they're building with support from the uh, Schmidt Futures Data for the American Dream grant and using the data that's in our system, in our, in our schema, to be able to populate those tools to help people be able to make more informed decisions about the pathways that they have available to them so they can make um, the best opportunities to get back into good jobs. Indiana is, is now putting in place um, the embedding of this credential information into digital credentials that are being issued in their state, both for all high school students as well as for all community college graduates. And they're working to make sure that this data is being embedded in, in credentials for all public 
uh, uh, public higher ed graduates. The same thing is gonna be happening in, in Colorado soon. Um, Alabama's, the governor's office is, is adopting credential transparency across the entire state. So a lot of really good things happening. A few policy recommendations um, that, that we would put forward. And Scott, I'm gonna interrupt you for a sec. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds and your question is gonna be in 30 seconds, which policy recommendations would you suggest? Perfect. Um, there is movement now to require that uh, getting access to Department of Education and Department of Labor grant funds, that you should be putting your data about credentials and competencies being created with those funds into open schema linked data formats. That should be taking place across the entire federal government. Every dollar going out to support credentials and competencies should carry a requirement to also have that data be in these kind of formats so they can be used across these kind of new tools like ILRs and, and pathway tools. Scott, thank you so much. That time was perfect. Sorry to rush you at the end there. Um, I do want to finally turn it over to my colleague at Third Way, Kelsey Berkowitz. Kelsey's our final speaker and is going to talk about Third Way's work on how to make faster connected credentials a reality. Kelsey, take it away. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so I'd like you all to imagine something with me. You're a worker in the middle of your career who's decided to go back to school. Maybe you want to upgrade your skills to keep up with the changing demands of your job, or you want to find a new career. With the help of a career counselor, you're able to find a high quality credentialing program that will lead to employment in your chosen career. And you might be nervous to go back to school. Maybe you have a family and a job in addition to your new role as a student, um, but you're able to juggle those responsibilities because you have supports to help you, like childcare and housing and transportation assistance. You've been given credit for what you already know, so you can just focus on the classes that you actually need to earn your credential. And you're able to successfully earn your credential, which then goes on your digital learning record. So you own a comprehensive picture of what you've learned over your life, and you can easily share it with employers or education providers so that they can see exactly which skills you've mastered. That is the future of credentialing, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility. We've heard from a number of speakers today who've shown that. Um, but making this a reality is an effort that's gonna require all of us in the education and workforce space, including policymakers at all levels. Uh, and so Third Way has published a series of reports looking at what the hurdles are to building this credentialing system of the future and what solutions we can implement to remove those hurdles. We published the playbook, which has 30 ideas for things we should do to help people earn credentials more quickly, like encouraging employers to help their workers gain new skills, expanding apprenticeships so people can pursue in-demand credentials while earning a paycheck, and making sure that adult learners have access to credit for prior learning and wraparound supports. We've also uh, put forth ideas to modernize our credentialing system so that the different sources of learning people tap into over the course of their careers can be connected and easily shared. We should provide R&D funding so that entities developing this 21st century credentialing infrastructure have the ability to test their innovations and bring them online more quickly. And we should also make digital learning records available to everyone, no matter where they learn new skills, and encourage education providers to identify the skills they teach so employers and prospective learners can access this information. And these are necessary steps if we're going to make it easier for every American, no matter where they live or where they're from, to have economic opportunity in the digital age. Um, and I will say a lot has obviously changed since the pandemic began and we've seen millions of Americans lose their jobs in this crisis. The question now, or one of the questions now, is how can we help people come back from this? And gaining in-demand credentials is one way that we can help them re-enter the workforce and succeed. Making it easier to navigate different credentialing options and earn credentials and helping people share all the learning that they've done over the course of their careers as one cohesive narrative that's all part of how we can help people come back from this. So uh, these recommendations were needed before and the current situation really just underscores that. Kelsey, let me build on that. Um, how does the pandemic change the way we should think about hurdles to credentials and the way we can remove some of those? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I mean, I think a lot of the, the hurdles exist still. They might just look different. Like, you know, it's still tough to be an adult learner that's struggling um, work and school and family, but the day-to-day -day might look different. Um, and 
with the pandemic, you're just kind of layering a lot of a lot of stuff on top of that. Now, one of the biggest hurdles to whether you can earn a credential is just whether you have a broadband connection um, and whether the community or technical college that you were enrolled in has what it needs to pivot to deliver instruction virtually. Um, but a lot of the, the hurdles look the same. Um, lack of access uh, to training programs or lack of ability to afford training programs. And this may surprise people, but you know, uh, access to training funds is not universal, uh, it, not even for people who've lost their jobs. So um, making sure that we help people afford different programs, that we're helping them afford high quality programs, um, making sure that we're helping them navigate the thicket of credentials that exist, uh, those are all, those, those all have to be part of the discussion moving forward. Kelsey, thank you so much. And um, I really wanna thank all of our speakers today. Um, our goal at the outset was to give all of you a bunch of ideas about how to transform the credential ecosystem and introduce you to some really new and innovative and thoughtful um, thinkers on this topic. I think we did both. I know there's a lot more that we can unpack here, but I hope you will um, join me in reaching out to these panelists, asking for ideas, getting feedback, um, because it's gonna take all of us here on this um, video conference to solve these issues. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon.